Well, good morning, everybody. I am so excited that you are joining us today. We here at First Christian Church, we are celebrating our 100th birthday, and, and we're just so excited that you've joined us online today to participate with us, and, and we look forward to sharing with you. And, you know, God has just blessed us in so many ways, and uh, I'm just thankful that we're able to leverage our, 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 our abilities, our skills, our talents, and our resources to minister to this community and literally throughout the world. But do you know that sometimes you can be right in the front of something incredible and miss the perspective on how awesome it really is? You see, I want you to see that our church is about so much more and is so much bigger than this room in which we gather in. You see, what we do, what we are a part of, we are a part of influencing not only our city, our state, our nation, but also the world through various ministry partnerships and local outreach. And what we must do is that we must always be looking at what God is doing around us. And what we must never do as a people is that we must never, ever take that for granted. Now, I want to just share with you right now the importance as we look at ministry ahead for not only this church in the years to come, but also for any church, for any Christian, and that is what you sow is what you're going to reap. And I want to tell you right now, this ground is good for sowing right here. God has used this church in amazing ways in the past, in the present, and I'm so excited about how God is going to leverage this church, this church family, in ministry for the future. And so again, this is good ground for sowing. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. You see, as a church, we have come way too far to stop now. And this is an incredible journey that demands and is continually demanding a transformed mind to the purposes of God, a heart filled with the love of Jesus Christ, and hands that are faithful to the mission that is before us. Now, for some of you who are older, you may have said to yourself, you know, that this may very well be your last lap in your life or maybe in your service, but I'm here to tell you today, you'll never know that if you stop. And I hope and pray that testimonies will be shared years down the road that I didn't stop in my life and in my ministry and my service of God. What about you? The Bible tells us also in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 36 that says you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what you have has been promised. And so I just want to encourage you, don't quit too quickly. And you know, a lot of times I think that we can all relate to that. I know there's a lot of people that, you know, if you don't lose 10 pounds in the first week at the gym, a lot of people are going to quit. Or if, you know, you quit doing cardio if you're not an Olympic athlete within a month. And so what we need to do is that we need to keep on going so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And you know, once you've been walking with God a little while, for some people, for some reason, things just seem like it's just no longer impresses you that much. And people grow weary. And they say to themselves that they're looking or want something fresh. Well, folks, I want to tell you today that it requires courage for those who have the faith not only to start something, just as it does for those who have the faith and the fortitude to finish. You see, we just can't be a people who show up. We must be those who pay the price in perseverance because that's who we must be as the body of Christ. Amen? Now, Today what I want to do is I want to talk to you about God's purpose in your life, my life, and in the life of the body of Christ. And I want to talk specifically here to First Christian Church. 
You see, the Apostle Paul, one of, one of my personal heroes of the Bible, we often read his writings, but sometimes I don't think we understand what was behind the principles that he shared. You see, when you read his books, you can't help but notice that the suffering that he endured and to be able to share what he did and to be able to pin so much of that of the New Testament and to be able to write to us about the depths and the riches of Christ that he had to experience some personal depths, some pains, and some disappointment. But listen, folks, if you ever see anyone who's ever had, who has great spiritual strength, you can bet that it has been developed through some type of deep sorrow. And when we read over in the book of Acts chapter 27, we find the Apostle Paul is in the midst of a transition and also he's in significant trouble. And by the way, if you happen to be in either one of those states today, transition or trouble, if you're in transition or in trouble, I want you to know it is a good place to be because it is a place where God can do his deepest transformation in your life and mine. You see, it is my prayer and it must be our imperative that for the next 100 years or until the Lord returns, that we will be a church who will be willing to make necessary transitions in order to experience God's transformation. And God is always going to be working through his power to transform us into his image and likeness. You see, the Apostle Paul is in both. In fact, he's on board a ship. He's headed for Rome. And you know, it would be one thing if he was headed to Rome on Royal, Carib you know, Royal Caribbean or on a Disney cruise ship. Instead, he's not a visitor going to Rome. He is going to Rome on a ship as a prisoner bound hand and foot and probably associated with some pretty barbaric conditions. And if that's not enough, to be headed to Rome as a prisoner along the way, he along with the others, they encounter an unexpected difficult that was not their fault. And even in that difficulty, and we must learn this principle in our lives, even in that difficulty, we must have a spirit of faith that God's purpose will be fulfilled. And folks, we can take that to the bank. God's purpose always will be. We read in the book of Acts chapter 27 and verse number 9, it says, Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was, it was after the Day of Atonement. And so Paul warned them. You see, conditions weren't ideal, and honestly and truthfully, conditions rarely are perfect and ideal in our lives. Amen? Amen. But listen to what it says in verse number 10 and 11. It says, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Now, folks, listen. If someone just reads this, and just think for a moment, if you happen to be the centurion in this story, you're thinking to yourself, obviously that's what you do. Because if you're in charge of getting prisoners, and, uh, you know, to where they need to be safely, transporting them where they need to go, and you have the owner of the ship as well as the pilot of the ship saying that they need to keep going, and they can, and then you have this preacher on board talking about, no, I, I don't want you to go. I've been praying about this, and the Lord told me. Now, I want to just pause there for a moment because that phrase, the Lord told me, it's kind of like that Christian trump card. It means that I can say whatever I want to say next, and you're not allowed to say anything back in response because the Lord told me. And Paul says, the Lord told me, we shouldn't go. Now, as you read on here, folks, the text reveals that this guy had to make a decision, this centurion. And he's like, okay, 
I can listen to the pilot of the ship who has gone to nautical school, navigational training. He has maps and experience and has an understanding of how ships operate. And, and I can listen to the owner or I can listen to the preacher on board who just happens to be arrested. So here he is. He's weighing this preacher, prisoner, pilot, owner. And in his mind, he decides, I'm, you know, I think I'm going to go with the owner and the pilot on this deal. Now listen, folks. Paul was no ordinary preacher. Paul was on the boat because he was fulfilling the purposes of God. God is speaking through Paul to warn these men, but they are not listening. And I share this because this is an example how in our lives so often we listen to all the other voices on the boat we ride in, figuratively speaking. We listen to all the other indicators from other people, right? We listen to everyone else's ideas. We listen to everyone else's opinions. We listen to everyone else's assessment of the situation before we ever listen to God's so many times. But what we have to do is that we've got to make a decision and we have to write this down. You have to just lock this in your mind. And that what we need to consider is, will I steer my life by my sense or will I allow the Spirit of God to steer? You see, every ship is being steered by something. The ship represents your personal life, or the ship represents the church, the body of Christ, and the ship represents the direction that you're headed. The ship also represents all the things that God has given you. Now, I want you to follow me here. I know that this is a simple analogy, but it occurs to me that a lot of us are a lot like the centurion. Because instead of listening to what the voice of God says, because a lot of times what God may suggest it doesn't seem to make sense to us, we instead listen to our own senses because we can understand them. But can I tell you that there's a lot of stuff that God told people to do in the Bible that didn't make a lot of sense. And there's a very important life principle here that we need to remember, and that is that if you live your life by what makes sense, you will never become a person of strong faith. It is, it, I mean, it, if it always has to make sense for you to obey God, you'll never know what it means to sail out into deep waters and to fully trust him. I want you to just consider for a moment, when you consider our church family here at First Christian Church in 1960, at that particular time, this church was meeting in downtown Clearwater on South Fort Harrison, and they were having intense growing pains knowing they needed to do something. And trusting the leading of God, they purchased the five acres that we currently are on now when everyone in the community thought that they were crazy because this was nothing more than farmland back in that day. In fact, I was told this story, and I can't guarantee the accuracy, but this property was purchased from Norman Vincent Peale. I do know that. And Norman Vincent Peale authored books talking about the power of positive thinking, and yet it is said that he sold this property thinking that nothing would ever happen way out here in the country. And all I can say is that the rest is history. So the question I need to ask you is, are you living your life by what makes sense? If the answer is yes, then you're never going to live by faith. If you stop every time that things get confusing because it may not make sense to you, maybe you say to yourself, wow, this is really going to cost me or, or people are going to think that I'm weird or people aren't going to want to be around me or people are going to call me one of those kind of Christians. If you're always trying to make sense, then you'll probably never ever walk in faith.
The Bible tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7, it says, For we live by faith, not by sight. Now, I want you to think about those key areas of your life. Are you living according to your senses, what you can calculate, or are you living according to a sense of confidence in God's promise and that God is the one who does the math? Now, I've said this before here, and I want to say it again today. Outcome is God's responsibility, but obedience is yours. Obedience is mine. You don't have to understand to obey. We don't have to know where things are going to end up in order to take the next step. And in this passage, we see some men who just kept on sailing when they should have stopped. Now, this is going to be a disaster in this story because any time that you ignore God's instruction, you ignore God's warnings, Always know that the winds are always going to be against you. Listen to what it says in verses 13 through 15 back in Acts 27. It says, And when a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor, and they sailed along the shore of Crete. And before long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. And the ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. And so we gave way to it and we were driven along. Now, I pictured this in my mind. You know, when they had the wind at their backs, when they had the wind at their backs, it's kind of like us sometimes when we ignore God's warning. It feels like that you're making progress. But you see, even the progress that you think that you're making isn't, is ultimately going to lead you to disaster. Now listen to what the Bible says in the book of Mark. In the book of Mark, chapter 8 and verse number 36. It says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. Now, this is real important for us. You see, what we have to do is that if you're going with the wind, but the wind will be against you when you ignore the warnings of God. And I love this phrase in verse number 15, back in Acts chapter 27. It describes that so many of us are driven along. And you see, they were just going. They were sailing out there. They were going with the flow. But in reality, what happens is they end up losing total control. Verses 16 through 18, we go back there and take a look at that. In Acts 27, listen to what it says. It says, And as we pass the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard, and then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid they were run, ag a run aground on the sandbars of Cyrus, and they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. And we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. Now, there's that phrase again, driven along. And I wonder just how many people are driven along today because you ignored the warnings of God. You see, the Spirit of God has a purpose. It's not to threaten you, but he calls us in a gentle whisper through a wind saying, you need to pay more attention right here, or you need to put your heart back into this. You need to get back over here and do it like you used to do this, or you need to change this. Or maybe you've lost your passion and you need to really change. Or maybe you've lost your intensity, your focus, or maybe you've lost your first love. And all that's happening is, is that you're just driven along. And then when you're driven along, ultimately what ends up happening, you end up losing your anchor. 
And when you look in that verse number 18, you cannot help but see things are really getting bad. And you know, like some people's lives, you're just throwing stuff off. You're trying this and you're trying that and you're caught up in the middle of the storm. All up in the midst of trouble, all up in the midst of trials, all up in the midst of situations, and many of them you yourself created. I don't know about you, but I can certainly relate to that. The Bible also says this back in Acts 27, in verse number 19. Listen to what it says. It says, And on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging. You know, isn't that a terrible thing when the storm just keeps raging? Have you ever been in a storm in your life and it just felt like it was just nonstop and was just going just crazy? And you didn't think it would ever end? You see, you would often think that maybe they find themselves in that particular situation in distress. But in verse number 20, at the end of verse number 20, it says this. It says that we finally gave up all hope of being saved. You see, folks, distress is one thing. That's when you throw over the cargo or that's when you do something to try to save your life or try to make a way to where you need to get or you're still just trying to survive. But in their situation, eventually they went from distress to despair. And I believe that some of you have made a conclusion like that in your lives. And that's just how, how it is. You know, you think to yourself, I'm always going to be depressed. That's just how it is. I'm always going to be overweight. I'm always going to have health problems. I'm always going to be lonely. I'm always going to be addicted to this. I'm, I'm always going to be bitter. Or I'm always going to be negative. That's just how it is. We're just driven along. And he said, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, when we lose our guiding light, that's when we have a tendency to give up hope. My question is, do we have any drifters out there today? I wonder who God has brought to watch and be online and sharing with us today because you're drifting. Now, folks, here's what I love about God. I want you to listen to what, he said, what the Scripture says in verse number 21. It says, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete, and then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. <laughs> you know, I, I really think that's, that's awesome, you know, when you look at this. He said, listen, you've lost some time. You've lost some cargo. You may have lost some money, some moments, some people. Maybe you've lost peace. Maybe you've lost some brain cells in your life. I don't know. I don't know what all you've lost. But here's what I know the Lord says, and this is what we need to lean into. Men, you should have taken my advice. Why? Because his advice was the word of God. Now, guys, we've probably heard from our wives that many times ourselves. You should have taken my advice. But listen, folks, God is just simply saying that if you would learn to do things the right way, my way the first time, things would have gone a whole lot better for you, and there's not near the consequences that you're experiencing now. He said you could have spared yourself this damage and this loss. And folks, this is where the encouragement really comes in. Because listen to what it says in verse number 22. It says, but now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. That's an awesome two words right there, but now. It is awesome because we serve a right now God. Amen? The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 1 that faith that when we learn about faith faith is the faith tells us there in Hebrews chapter 1 listen to what it says now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see and you know I 
can't see the stars in this situation in Acts 27. I can't see the end. I can't see the dry ground. But now, Scripture says, Paul said, I forget what's behind me. I reach toward what's ahead because right now God is working. You see, we, learn, we need to learn to say that phrase, but now. But now, we're not putting this off anymore. But now, we're not going to defer obedience anymore. But now, we're not going to drift along one more day. But now, right now, the right time to do the right thing is right now. But now I urge you, he says, to keep your courage because not one of you, and I know it was your mistake, but not one of you will be lost. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I can't help but think that that is the message of a merciful God. Now, what if he didn't get me in that situation? You see, I've heard preachers over the years say, well, if God gets you into something, God's going to always get you out. Well, in this particular situation, they got themselves into it. But you know what's amazing is that God looks at this and he says, I'm still going to be coming out looking for you. I'm going to get you out. I'm going to snatch you out of the grasp of this storm. I'm going to save you. I'm going to give you another chance. I'm still going to love you. I'm going to call you by name. I'm going to accept you. I can use you. And he said, not one of you will be lost. But what about the boat? You see, it's not going to be so good for the boat. The text says that only the ship will be destroyed. Now, let me ask you a question. Is this good news or bad news? Well, I guess it depends on what your priority is in the situation. If what you care about the most is the boat, when the boat goes down, your hope goes with it. Paul said, keep your courage, men, because not one of you will be lost. Now, he's basically saying, you know, this ship, we can talk about that later. But, you know, as for you, sometimes our hope is too much in what we want God to do. And sometimes our hope is in our plan for how we want to get where we think God wants to take us. But, folks, here's the truth you can bank on. If your hope is in your plan, when your plan is interrupted, your faith fails or falters. So the question I want to ask you is, are you focused on how you thought it was going to happen, that you're missing the way that God wants to bring it about? And that's what Paul's trying to get across to these men to see. He says, we're not going to get there in the boat, which... I would prefer, by the way, he said, I like the boat. I'm a fan of the boat. I totally am into the boat. But there's no hope left in the boat. In other words, some things are never going to be like they were before. And as a church, we can't rest in the ways and the accomplishments of the past. Verses 23 and 24 says this, Last night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. The Bible teaches us that God goes before us. He goes before us and beside us. And I'm glad that God is a all he's an omnidirectional God. He's with us continually. He's gone into my future, and he's prepared it. He's gone into my past and redeemed it. And he's right here beside me in this moment to comfort me and give me courage. Verses 25 and 26 says this, So keep your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. And nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. You've got to keep your courage up. You've got to look at those near you and say, keep your courage up. Your boat might go down, but keep your courage up. Your bank account might be faltering, but keep your courage up. You might not have done very well in your last semester of school, but keep your courage up. 
And sometimes the only thing that is in your control, that is in my control, is our courage. Our conditions are not always in our control. You don't always get to decide what kind of skies you face or what the seas will be like when you sail or decide what the forecast is going to be. There are some things that are just going to be out of our control, but courage is in our control. It just depends on what you're focused on. For some of you, you've lost your courage and you've lost your confidence and you've lost your hope and you've lost your joy. But do you want to know why? The chances are it is because all your hope was in the boat. Listen, folks, if, if, if God spoke it, I hold on to it. And that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. You see, I believe that God finishes what he starts. We may have been a church that's been around for a hundred years, but we just need to remember that God's the one who started it, and he will continue to use it for his purposes until our work is finished. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to have an opportunity to minister in this community and throughout this world. Help us, Lord, to be faithful into the future. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We hope that you'll continue in your time of worship to God by taking communion as a family. Let's do this in remembrance of Jesus. We'd like to encourage you to take a few moments to worship through giving. You can bring a check or cash to the office. You can give online at fccclearwater.org, click give, or you can text any dollar amount to 84321. We look forward to seeing you next week, church family. Love y'all.